So Jesus did not suggest that we have no concern at all for the future because everything's pre-programmed anyway, so you don't have to bother to look both ways when you cross the street. He's saying, don't be stressed out about things you can't control. In fact, the last verse we read just a minute ago said, whatever you've learned from me, put into practice and the God of peace will be with you. Sometimes the best cure for worry is action. You worried about the test? Well, study. You worried about your health? Eat more carefully and exercise more. You worried about dying and facing God? Then give your life to Christ and be cleansed by his blood and be confident of your salvation. Be concerned enough to take action when possible, but don't be burdened with anxiety about things you can't possibly control. There's a song about that. Turn your eyes upon Jesus and look full in his wonderful face and the things of this earth grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and grace. The Bible says that will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. So when you're anxious, lift up your eyes. Look upon the hills. Your help comes from the Lord. Well, good morning, family. Good to see you. As always, good to have you with us. You're in for another great day today. And just the last weekend, we had such a great weekend. Last weekend, if you missed it, go back and watch it. But we really, Bob's sermon, we just saw the recap, really was so good on just reframing your thinking. And so I know my wife and I were talking about it all week as uh, trying not to stress about things and trying not to be ruled by anxiety. <clears throat> but I love this. So many of you had comments too. As a matter of fact, Karen said this, Lord, you move in power in our lives. You're our healer, our rock. We stand on your faithfulness. Greetings again from Canada, my church family. And so just want to say, Karen, greetings. You didn't have to send all your cold down here. We're freezing down here, uh, but love you. Glad that you're a part of us. Uh, Linda said this. Thank you for this wonderful message, Bob. I needed to hear this so much. I'm isolated and hopeless in the situation I'm living with. Your message has given me hope in the peace of the Lord. I love that, Linda. Brandy from YouTube said, you have to reframe your thinking and fill your mind with positive thoughts. And that is so true, and that's what we've been doing. And so if, if, if anything you heard last week, Bob said, hey, listen, we got to put this into action, right? If this was your body, if your, if your health was off, then here's the thing, you, you'd eat better and you'd exercise. But when it comes to our thinking, you also have to take action. And he gave us several opportunities to just step in, to dive into the word, and to, but part of what he said, and I wanted, we wanted to make sure you heard this, but sometimes you got to get help. And so what we wanted to make sure that you knew is our care team would love to be that help and at least get you pointed in the right direction if we, if we at all possibly could. And so all you got to do, sex word care to 733-733. We'd love to do that with you. As a matter of fact, any of you, if there's something going on in your life, if you're brand new, if you want to get connected, you need to get in a group, you're trying to figure out how to follow Jesus, if we can help you, just text the word connect, 733-733. Would love to help you. But here's what we're going to do today. Today, we're going to kind of create a little space. I don't know where you are right now, but create a little space in your heart and your mind. And we're just going to dive in. Dave Stone's going to be talking about uh, reframing our contentment. And so we're just, we're just going to receive that today. I don't know about you, but I can receive a word on just how to be content, how to receive God's goodness and just recognize that it's good. And so uh, create your little space in your heart and your mind. Let's head into worship. Run for cover Still the miracle That I just can't get over It's my name He's registered in heaven I believe in signs and wonders And I have resurrection power Yes I do So I
Amen, amen. You can have a seat. <laughs> oh, all hail King Jesus. Amen. Amen. Mm. Yeah, I love that that's the song we sang as we step into this next act of worship. If you've been church here, any, you probably know that we're about to step into uh, the special time that we call communion. Maybe when you grew up, it was called the Lord's Supper, but either way, it's this special time. It's actually one of the most clear ways that Jesus called us to worship him. For those of you who don't know what communion is, communion is this act of worship that has existed in the church for generations. It's hails from this moment that Jesus had with his disciples before he went to the cross. Around the table, they were having a meal. Jesus in that meal held up a piece of bread. He broke the bread and he said, hey, this bread is my body laid down for you. And he told his disciples to eat it to remember him. And then it says later in that meal, he held up a cup and he said, hey, this cup is my blood in the new covenant for the forgiveness of sins. Drink this in remembrance of me. And what God gave us in that moment was this memorial that would constantly remind us that the work was finished. And so as a body of believers, we do this together. It's a family meal. It's a moment that despite our differences, we are bound together as one. And so it's a sacred moment. So with that said, this meal is for those who have placed their faith in Jesus, those who have been baptized into the family. If that's not you, what you get to see is just one of those special moments, a privilege of being a child of God. Now, I love this moment because it's one of those moments that brings us back into the good theology of Christ dependency. As we're swimming through an ocean of striving, this moment snatches us out of that water and it, it lays us beside still waters in a pasture of God's grace and his provision. And when we sit in a moment like that, when I think of a moment like that, my mind runs back to this prayer that has become more meaningful to me over the last year and it never really meant anything to me until about a year ago God connected me with a member of our church and through that relationship we became deep friends and a part of that friendship was me just journeying with this man in the process of recovering his life and there will be times that we would sit in his garage and as we sat in that garage we would talk about where life was taking us we would have a moment of prayer and he would oftentimes invite me to pray this prayer alongside him, and it's the serenity prayer. Some of you know it. And so what I want to do today as we think about this Christ dependency is to read this prayer over us as, as a grace for our meal, as a blessing over this time. And so I ask you to bow your heads. I just want you to hear these words. I just want you to feel the release that happens when you accept these words for yourself. Hear what they say says, God, grant us the serenity to accept the things we cannot change, the courage to change the things we can, and the wisdom to know the difference. Living one day at a time, enjoying one moment at a time, accepting hardship as a pathway to peace, taking as Jesus did this sinful world as it is and not as we would have it, trusting that you will make all things right if we surrender to your will so that we may be reasonably happy in this life and supremely happy with you forever in the next. Amen. In the next moment, we're gonna have a verse on the screen and some soft music playing and that's your time to sit with God and to, and to really let your mind go to just how supremely happy you will be one day when you get to spend eternity with Christ forever. Throughout that moment, I invite you to eat and drink when you're ready.
desperation, I turned to heaven and spoke your name into the night. Then through the darkness, your loving kindness tore through the shadows of my soul. The work is finished. Christ, my living hope. Who could imagine so great a mercy? What heart could fathom such boundless grace? The God of thank you that those words that we just sang are true. And we thank you that for everything that you were, everything that you are, and everything that you will be. And Jesus, we thank you for the cross. And we thank you that we get to spend eternity with you. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Y'all can grab a seat.
For those of you who have your MBA, you may be familiar with a, a case study. It actually involved a company opening up a banana factory several decades ago in a very remote part of Central America. And workers were literally living in huts with, with nothing, so the labor was quite inexpensive. But something happened that they didn't expect. After the workers got their very first paycheck, the majority of them quit. You see, they, they had never had that much money in their lives, and they thought that it would last for so long, and so they, they quit their jobs. Well, the leadership was shocked, and they had no idea how to remedy the situation until one of the leaders in the company came up with a, a brilliant plan. You know what they did? They started shipping shopping catalogs and shopping magazines to the village so that the people could see the things that they didn't have that other people had. And rather quickly, the former employees started ordering and buying things which depleted their savings, and pretty soon, magically, all these workers went back to work so that they could continue to make more purchases. Now, it almost sounds corrupt for a company to do that to, to someone, doesn't it? And yet, that's what happens each and every day of our lives. That's the purpose of advertising, is to make us feel incomplete or discontent because we don't have a product or a particular service. And somehow you'll be the only one who will be missing out, so you've, you've got to have it. But it, it doesn't take seeing pictures of products in order for us to feel discontent. It, it seems that it happens quite naturally. At least it, it does for me, anyway. I remember a few years ago, I was on an airplane, and while I was flying on that particular day, I was writing a sermon on coveting. And so I was in the middle of that, and the flight attendant came past, and she said, would you like some peanuts? I said, I love peanuts, sure. And she gave me a, a small bag of, of peanuts, and I was so excited. And then uh, a minute or so later, I saw her turn to the person on the other side of the aisle right next to me, and she said, well, would you like some peanuts? And he said, sure, I'd love some. And she gave him a bag, and then he looked at her, and he said, can I have another bag? And she said, yes, and she gave it to him, and I'm like, what? You know, I, I, I love peanuts. And so for the next 20 minutes, all I could think about was the fact that, oh, he gets 12 peanuts and I only get six peanuts, right? And so I was frustrated over this and I kept thinking about the entire flight until finally she made her way back up the aisle and as she went past me, I said, ma'am, I said, could I get another bag of peanuts? And she said, sure. I said, you know what, let's make it two. And she gave me two bags. If you could have seen that guy's face across the aisle. I mean, he tried to act like it didn't bother him, but he knew he'd lost. <laughs> Final score, 18 to 12, right? Now, I wish I could tell you that my discontentment is simply limited to snacks on an airplane, but it's far more reaching than that. And if, if yours is too, then... Maybe Paul will have some wisdom and counsel for both of us. We've been seeing what the Apostle Paul has to say in the book of Philippians, and today we're going to conclude our series on reframing our lives. And we're gonna look at reframing our contentment. And that word for contentment can be translated satisfied, adequate, sufficient. It's that elusive feeling of, of being satisfied and having no desire for more. And today we're gonna to cover Philippians chapter four, verses 10 through 20, but we're actually gonna walk through the, the back part of the passage first, and then we're gonna come back to the first part of Philippians four. So follow along with me in Philippians chapter four, verse 14. Yet it was good of you to share in my troubles, so Paul begins by expressing his appreciation for the, the way the church at Philippi has faithfully supported him in his ministry endeavors. And we pick it up with verse 15. Moreover, as you Philippians know, in the early days of your acquaintance with the gospel, when I set out from Macedonia, not, not one church shared with me in the matter of giving and receiving, except you only. So, this is a special relationship, and, and Paul doesn't want to gloss over their generosity. 
And there was a time early on when the church at Philippi was the only one who was willing to take a risk on the Apostle Paul's missionary endeavors. And they were, they were the first ones to do it, to go out on a limb of faith and give their support to him as he sought to reach out to others. They said, we'll step up to the plate. I said, we'll, we'll support you. And it makes me think of so many people here at Southeast who have, have been a part of this church and then they felt like God called them to the mission field and they just took that step of faith. I promise you, every single one of those people could tell you the very first person that stepped up and said, I'll support you. I believe in you. I believe that God has called you to do this. In 2 Corinthians, Paul talks about the Macedonian churches. Well, Philippi was one of those churches. And here's how Paul describes them in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 3 through 5. He says, Entirely on their own, they urgently pleaded with us for the privilege of sharing in this service to the Lord's people. And they exceeded our expectations. They gave themselves, first of all, to the Lord, and then by the will of God, also to us. So this was, was God's will for their life to be involved in this. It's our will, our, it's God's will for us that we would be involved in that as well. And the greatest way to overcome greed is through learning to let go and to give. It, it seems like such a dichotomy, and yet it actually serves to make you more content. And for the Philippians, giving to Paul's ministry was more than an act of benevolence. It was an active partnership. And when you give to the church or you give to other Christian missions, you instantly become a partner in the work. You're part of the team, of the solution, of, of spreading the gospel. Philippians chapter 4, verses 16 and 17. For even when I was in Thessal Thessal Thessalonica, you sent me aid more than once when I was in need. Not that I desire your gifts. What I desire is that more be credited to your account. Well, what does that mean, more credited to your account? Well, Jesus in the Sermon on the Mount talks about don't store up earthly treasures where moth and rust can destroy, but he says you store up heavenly treasures where moth and rust cannot destroy and where thieves cannot break in and steal. And he once said they're giving to be credited to their heavenly account. And in Paul's mind, more important than the gift was the opportunity that they had to be partners in the gospel. And Paul makes it clear that he's not asking them for more money from his prison cell, but at the same time, he doesn't want them to miss out on the joy of being a partner in God's work. In 2 Corinthians chapter 9, it says, God loves a cheerful giver. And that word for cheerful is the word hilarious. In other words, our, our giving should seem ridiculous to the world. But, but to God, it, it pleases him. Look at verse 18. I have received full payment and have more than enough. I am amply supplied now that I have received from Epaphroditus the gifts that you sent. They are a fragrant offering, an acceptable sacrifice, pleasing to God. Now, Epaphroditus was the name of a guy who had a mutual ministry connection with both Paul and the Philippians. So he kind of becomes the first century UPS man, and he brings some gifts from the church of Philippi to Paul in prison. We don't know what the gifts were that he brought, but whatever they were, the Bible says that they were pleasing to God, and those phrases, fragrant offering and acceptable sacrifice, that's a reference back to the Old Testament temple and sacrifices to burn Sweet smelling incense, 24 seven. In, in Exodus, it says that that pleased God. Because when we let go and we give back, not only is he pleased, but the second result is that God will, will meet your needs. I, I love these next two verses in Philippians chapter four, verses 19 and 20. It says, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. To our God and Father be glory forever and ever, amen. So I put this in different colors just so some things jump out at you. Where he says, and my God, it's personal. When it says, we'll meet all your needs, that's, that's a promise from God. When it says, the riches, what's that referring to? Well, it's plentiful. God, 
gives us immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine. And when it says the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus, that's where the power comes. The power comes through Christ Jesus. So it's a personal promise. It is plentiful and it's powerful. And notice it doesn't say God will meet all of your wants. It says that God will meet all of your needs. And sometimes our, our, our wants and our needs get confused. A couple of months ago, I, I took Beth to the Highway 127 yard sale. <laughs> At all of our campuses, raise your hand if you have ever been to the Highway 127 yard sale. Yes, yes, I see that hand, yes. Uh, it was my first time, but it is a sale that goes all the way from Alabama to Michigan along Highway 127. And basically people set up shop along the road for three days and they sell things. And I, I walked up and as soon as I walked up, there, there is a hula hoop there. And I said to the guy, I said, hey, how, how much is the hula hoop? He said, $20. <laughs> like 20, it's a piece of plastic stuck together. That's all it is, right? Now the Highway 127 yard sale garners the attention of people all over. There are literally hundreds of places to stop. Now, Beth didn't take me to all of them. It just seemed like she did. Uh, but we went on Friday, and I think that was the first day, and Beth saw a teapot somewhere near Lawrenceburg, and the guy wanted $15 for it. Well, I had $15 in my wallet. I'm getting ready to pull $15 out of the wallet. Oh, no, 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 don't make that mistake, husband, all right? She said, would, would, you, would you take less than 15 for it? The guy said, oh, no, no, I, I, I couldn't do that. So I said, well, I, I've, I've got the money. Oh, no, 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 no. She walked away and she said, it's worth probably $10, maybe a little bit more, but I'm not gonna pay $15. So we drove all the way back home. But on Sunday afternoon, we were at home and she started wondering if that teapot, teapot might still be there. And she said, and if so, it's, it's the last day. And maybe I could get a deal. She said, you know, on Friday, it was $15. It's the last day. He's getting rid of stuff. Maybe I could get it for $5. So we got in the car. <laughs> and we drove all the way back to Lawrenceburg, Kentucky. And it was there. And she got it for $5. <laughs> yes, there it is. There it is. I know you're proud of her accomplishment. I was proud of it, right? And now it proudly sits in my daughter-in-law's uh, living room on her shelf. But all I could think as we drove back home for our second round trip of the weekend, all I could think was 32 miles one way, 32 and 32 is 64, 64 and 64 are 128, 25 miles per gallon. <laughs> Gas that week was $4.32 a gallon. You know what I'm thinking, I'm doing the math, right? So as I drove home, I started to point those numbers out to her, but then I remembered why we've stayed married for 37 years. <clears throat> and so I didn't bring it up to her, but I felt safer telling you. <laughs> now the truth is, I am, I am very grateful to have a bride who's not wrapped up in labels and names. And if my biggest challenge is my wife spending gas money, to and from an inexpensive yard sale, then I, I should be really content. And I'm, I'm thankful that she's always been content and that she understands the difference between wants and needs. And Paul says, God will meet all of your needs according to his glorious riches found in Christ Jesus. And that's a reference of our needs to what Jesus says in Matthew chapter six when he says, Seek first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness in his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you as well. Well, what things? Not your wants, but your needs. The previous paragraph talks about food, clothing, and shelter. And God says, you know what? If you trust me, I'll, I'll take care of those basic necessities for you. And what a reassurance to every one of us that my God will meet all of my needs in Christ Jesus. And if we wonder if emotionally and relationally and physically and spiritually, if, if somehow God will meet our needs, he's gonna take care of us. Here's what Paul is saying to the Christian community. He's saying, you are not alone, ever. 
I'm thinking of some of the painful stories that I've, uh, I've heard in just recent days. A woman who gave birth to a stillborn child. You are not alone. A man who got downsized after three decades of integrity as an exemplary employee and having consistent integrity. You are not alone. A teen wrestling with whether to pursue ministry apart from his parents' blessing or whether just to go party with his friends at the university like all of his siblings have done. You are not alone. Parents who lost their son to a tragic accident, you are not alone. The woman who is suffering physical health problems because of a blow to the head years before from an abusive husband, you are not alone. You may feel alone at times, but the apostle Paul is saying you're not. You have the Holy Spirit. Romans chapter eight, verse 26, it says, the spirit helps us in our weakness. We do not know what we ought to pray for, but the spirit himself intercedes for us through wordless groans. So when you are so distraught, you don't even know what to pray. You don't even have the words. The Holy Spirit living inside of you will take those thoughts in your heart and will carry them to the Lord. You are not alone. You have a God who will meet all your needs in Christ Jesus. Don't worry about how it is that he's gonna bless you. Don't worry about those things. He, he might increase your income. He might decrease your expenses. He might sustain your household appliances. He, he may keep your car out of the shop. He might protect your health. God blesses us in his way according to to his timetable, not ours. And some of you are thinking, well, now what, what does generosity and giving and all this have to do with contentment? And why would you start at the end of this passage and now come back to the start? Well, it's because generosity and contentment are key steps in, in, in moving toward having that relationship with the Lord where we have a Christ dependency. We rely on him. Philippians chapter four, we begin the passage in verses 10 and 11. It says, I rejoice greatly in the Lord that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Paul writes those words while chained to someone sitting in a prison cell. And he says, I've learned to be content whatever the circumstances. Let me make three observations when it comes to contentment. Number one, contentment can be learned. It's not inherent. It's not innate. It's not, you're not born with it. It's not instilled at birth. And the fact that contentment can be learned should be great news for every one of us that it's possible for us to develop this. You can learn to be content. But when comparison is present, contentment becomes impossible. You, you understand that that's true whether it's a package of peanuts on a plane or whether it's the clothes that you keep in your closet. The problem is that we like to play the comparison game, but comparisons will always chip away at contentment. Comparisons serve as a barrier to contentment. Do y'all remember when Instagram started? We all were excited about Instagram. The first few years, what would happen? You would scroll through 20 or 30 different posts, and then out of the blue, there would be an ad. You're like, oh, wow, look at that. And you check out that ad. Well, gradually what they did over time was they started to increase the frequency of the ads. And so now you can't scroll through four or five posts without being shown some ad for something. And it will show you some product that you've never even heard of. But now you're pretty convinced that your life is not complete without it, right? And yet with two clicks of your finger, you could have that at your front door in two days. And the frightening thing is that the products that they push on you are things that you've mentioned out loud in the last 24 hours. And that your, your mobile device is listening to the things that you're saying and they're figuring out the things that are important to you. And you say, wow, that's unnerving, that's unsettling, it is. 
unless you use it to your advantage. And so now what I do is whenever Beth leaves the room, I grab her cell phone and I say, men's golf clubs, new golf clubs, (laughs) Christmas gifts, kind-hearted husband, new golf clubs, Christmas gift exchanges, new golf clubs, right? (laughs) And you just say that enough times and eventually she'll get the message, I hope, right? (laughs) Now we usually think of finances and money when we think about contentment, but I think it goes beyond that. Are we, are we content with where we are right now in our life? Are we content with this particular stage? I mean, think about it. We spend most of our life wishing it away. Oh, I wish for this, I wish for that. When we're in middle school, I can't wait till I get in high school. And then when you're in high school, oh, I can't wait till I leave the house and I can go away for college. Then you get in college and what do you start thinking about? You know what? I just gotta get a job. When I get out, I'm gonna land that first job. You get the job. I, when I get married, that's when I'm gonna be content. When I get married and I find that special person, you find that special person, you get married and you say, you know what, when we have kids, that's when my life will be complete. Well, you have kids and then all of a sudden you say, well, when I have grandkids, right? <laughs> and you look onto the next stage and pretty soon you say, I can't wait till I can retire. And then you retire and, and pretty soon you say, well, I can't wait till somebody else can take care of all my needs. And then pretty soon you're in an old folks home and you're 90 years old and you say, I can't wait till I die. <laughs> because my hip will be fine, my rotator cuff won't bother me, and I'll be able to eat solid food. I can't wait to go to heaven, right? And we wish everything away for the the next stage. I wonder what would happen if we could just be content in the stage where God's got us. Last week, I was was preaching in Southern California, and last Sunday, I got talking with a man. I'd never met him before. I really liked this guy. He had been a university president at two different universities, and we got talking, and he just, he just had a joy about him, kind of like what Philippians talks about. And he said this to me. He said, Dave, he said, there's, there's three stages of life. He said, there is learning. He said, then there is earning. And then he said, said this. He said, there's returning. That's the last stage. And he said, that's the most fun stage. And he said, that's the stage I'm in now. Now, I understand that some of those stages overlap, but his goal is just to keep giving everything away and giving it back to others and giving it back to the Lord and just investing in kingdom projects. There's something that happens that builds your joy and builds your contentment when you can look at each stage of your life and say, okay, Lord, you've got me here for a reason. And so many times we look at what we have or what we don't have, and we play that comparison game. Second Corinthians chapter 10, verse 12, it's just very blatant. It says, we do not dare to classify or compare ourselves with some who commend themselves. When they measure themselves by themselves and compare themselves with themselves, they are not wise. He says, don't compare yourself. Don't don't go around with a measuring tape seeing how much they have. Because if they have more, it will just make you want to covet that. And if they have less, you'll become proud and say, well, look, see, I, I don't need that much in order to be happy. But if your contentment is wrapped up in your financial portfolio, then your self image is tied to how the stock market did last week. And if your self image is tied to your appearance, then the older you get, the worse you'll feel about yourself and who it is that God made you to be. And if your contentment is tied to your house or to your job, those things are temporary. They might be gone tomorrow. So have that Christ dependency. Well, here's a second observation. Contentment is an attitude you embrace today. It's not a place that you arrive in the future. It starts today, it starts now by taking those steps and changing the way you approach possessions. It means that we don't try to spend our lives endlessly trying to keep up with the Joneses. One guy asked, how can I ever get out of debt when my neighbor keeps buying things that I can't afford? (laughs) James chapter four, verses one and two. What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You desire, but you do not have. And so you kill, you covet, but you cannot get what you want. So you quarrel and fight. And let me just challenge those of you who have been blessed and 
who continue to acquire and, and, and build wealth, I, I just want you to know it is entirely possible that the more things you have and the more money you make, the less content you can become if you get your eyes off of Jesus. And I say that from personal experience. And Jesus gives us a strict warning in Luke chapter 12, verse 15. It's a, a warning for us to get our lives under control. This is what Jesus says. He says, watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. Life does not consist in an abundance of possessions. And that word greed is the, the Greek word is it's pleonexia. And pleonexia means this, always wanting more. Always being in pursuit of that next shiny thing. Oh, if I have that, then everything will be okay. Early on in our marriage, late one night, there was something going on with one of our kids and my wife, Beth, said, hey, can you go to Kroger for me? And she gave me a list of four different items. She handed it to me and I said, oh, I'll be glad to go get it. I went, I'd, I'd never really been to Kroger by myself. <laughs> and it was an adventure. I mean, I saw things I had never seen before. I were, there were chocolate things. There were things that were just kind of everywhere at the end of aisles. And I'm like, oh, here's Oreos and they're for sale. And right at the end of the aisle and they look delicious. And, and I saw other things at the end of other aisles. And I got up by the counter and I mean, when I came home, I had two full bags that I was carrying and Beth's jaw dropped down here. And she said, what in the world happened? I said, I'll tell you what happened. I just saved us a lot of money. I said, these things were all on sale, baby. I said, I didn't make a bad deal. I found, the great, found this great deal on Oreos at the end of the aisle. I was walking past the display. They had bacon on special. I went on and on. I said, I came up by the counter. I said, they had two liters of Coke. If you bought four, you got two of them for free. I said, it was un unbelievable. She said, they put those things there by the counter and by the end of the aisle for impulse buyers. I said, what's an impulse buyer? She said, you. <laughs> She said, how much, did, how much did you spend? Well, this was over 25 years ago, okay? I, I sheepishly said, I, I spent $37. And Beth looked at me and she lowered the boom and she said, that's the last time I'll ever send you to the grocery store. <laughs> she had fallen into my trap. <clears throat> Now, her yard sale skills probably would have got it for $27, right? But, but I'm reminded of what Solomon warned in Proverbs chapter 21, verse 5. He said, plan carefully and you will have plenty. But if you act too quickly, you will never have enough. And if you're going to grow in this area and become content, then you will have to rein in your spontaneity. And I will have to rein in my impulsivity. Well, here's a third observation. It's a final observation Contentment is a choice. It's not based on circumstances. You see, usually we think of happiness is dependent upon happenings, right? But the book of Philippians, if it has taught us anything, it's that our joy is not found in those things. Our joy comes from within. It's from our relationship that we have with Jesus Christ. Look at Philippians chapter four, verses 12 and 13 says, I know what it is to be in need. He says, I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. And that's what happens is, Paul says, I've been on both sides of the track, but Christ is the one who gives me the strength. Christ is the one who strengthens me. And so we've got to rely upon him. Now we've all heard Philippians 4.13. I can do all things through Christ who, who strengthens me. But I want you to look back at, at, at verse 12. And I've, I've highlighted a phrase up here for you. I have learned, remember we can learn contentment. I have learned the secret of being content. And when we read that, something wells up within us and we want to say, oh, tell me, tell me. What's the secret? What's the secret to being content? Well, the secret is that Christ is the one who gives us strength and he empowers us through his spirit to do the impossible. Christ is the one who makes the difference. 
If you've ever gone to a, a, a comedy show and, and listened to a comedian, lots of times they, they will say something early on in their, in their set that's, that's really funny. And they'll just catch you off guard with it. And you'll be cracking up laughing over that one line. And then they'll go a lot of different directions in their show or in their routine. And they'll get you to where you forget about that one line. And then toward the end of their set, you know what they'll do? Out of the blue, they'll be talking about something way over here, but then they'll say that one line. And even though it didn't, you didn't think it fit with that story, all of a sudden he grabbed this line from here and he brings it back here and you bust out laughing. They call that a callback. And I think that's what Paul is doing. In Philippians chapter four, he says, I have learned the secret to being content. What's the secret? He does a call back to the previous page of his writing. Philippians chapter three, verse 10. Here's the secret. I want to know Christ. Everything comes back to Christ. I don't want to just know about him. I, I, I want to know Jesus. I don't want to be part of a religion. I want to be part of a relationship. I want to have such a relationship with Jesus Christ that he is the one who gives me strength. He is the one who gives me contentment because my dependency is on him. You know what's going to happen with your family uh, when you get together in the next month in, in December? Maybe you'll even do it at Thanksgiving. I don't know. But what's going to happen is you're going to, at some point, you're going to watch the movie Elf, Right? I love, I love that movie. I, I'm proud to say it's one of my favorite movies. I always love intellectual thrillers. Uh, <laughs> but it's, it's just such a fun movie. And there's this scene where Buddy the Elf is no longer at the North Pole, but now he is at, at Macy's and he's working right there in New York City. And the floor manager is going over different things with him and Buddy just keeps on smiling. Why are you smiling so much? I'm just happy. I smile all the time. And he keeps going back and forth with the floor manager. Finally, he tells him what he wants Buddy to be doing. And then he gets everybody's attention on the floor. He says, I got an announcement to make. He says, tomorrow morning at 10 o'clock, Santa Claus will be here. And Buddy hears that. And he goes, Santa, Santa Claus, he's going to be here, Santa. And what's he say next? He says, I know him. I know him. He doesn't say I know about him. He doesn't say, I've heard of him. He says, I know him. And the question for you today is, do you know Jesus? Do you know him? Because that's the only thing that matters. And you have to have that relationship with him. You see, our problem isn't wanting things too much. It's not wanting him enough. And so what that means is we have to crucify our our selfish and our sinful desires. We have to stop playing the game of comparison with everybody around us and learn to be content. And the way we learn to be content is by knowing Jesus. May we heed the words that the psalmist said in the Old Testament. The Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. Let's pray. Our Father in heaven, uh, probably not the sermon that people want to hear when Black Friday is coming. And yet, I pray that it will actually add fuel to our generosity and our giving, but that it will help us to learn to be content with what we have. May we never be content with, with who we are, but may we always be content with what we have. And Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ the one who gave us a reason to have hope, the one who has taken care of all of our needs. And Lord, may we get to know him, your son, Jesus Christ, in a personal way. It's in Jesus' name we pray, amen. You know, I wanna, um, I wanna make certain, I wanna make certain that you, you know that you have an opportunity to make a decision. Because if, if I talk about Christ being all sufficient and everything that we need and he'll meet all your needs, and then we don't give you a chance to respond to that in some way, then that's a bit as sad as it gets. It's like taking you to an amusement park and not letting you ride any rides. And the fun comes 
when you commit your life to Jesus Christ. The Bible says in John 10, 10, says that he wants to give us that abundant life. It means life to the fullest. It means that you'll have a joy that the world can't take away. Will there be tough times? Sure, there'll be tough times. Will you suffer for Christ? If you're truly living for him, yes, yes, you will. But I wanna challenge you to choose a decision that will have implications for eternity rather than for just this temporary life. And so if you've, if you've never said yes to Jesus, we have some people that would love to talk with you about that decision. They hang out in our next step area right over here on, on your left-hand side and my right-hand side on the first floor. And you can talk with him. You can share a prayer request. You can just say, I, I wanna know him. I know a lot of people, but I wanna know him. And uh, you can do that before you leave today. At any time and as we sing, before you leave, they'll, they'll be there. You know, uh, for those of you who have already made that commitment, let me just say that sometimes I think the world can't understand contentment because we as believers haven't shown them a good picture of what a content life looks like. And we say we've got Christ in our life. Our, our actions need, need to show that. So let's commit to living lives of, of contentment, regardless of what stage we might be in of our life, regardless of what we have or what we don't have. Uh, this next song that we're gonna sing as we continue to worship is a song that I think you're gonna wanna sing along with, and it's an old song, but it's one that reminds us that we can have that contentment in our heart, and that can only come when we have our dependency on Christ. Let's stand together and let's worship. Be rolled back as 
Worldwide Southeast Online family. So glad that you've joined us here. What a great weekend as we wrap wrap up our Reframe series. Uh, we'd love to hear from you. So if anything connected with you at all, I'd love to hear from you. Text the word uh, CONNECT to 733-733, and we're going to follow up with you and going to connect with you. But before we go any further, I'm joined here with Sarah Parks. Hey, guys. How are you? We're looking back at the Reframe series. Yeah. We're looking back at Dave's message today. Mm -hmm. So Sarah, take yeah. us in, reframe, oh, what man. are you thinking? Gosh, this was a really convicting message for me personally. I think for all of us, yeah. honestly, as we go into this Christmas season talking about contentment, because we are about to enter in Thanksgiving on Thursday, but then the day after Thanksgiving, what happens, Stephen? Yeah, the Black Friday. Black yeah, Friday. people <laughs> shop and the, yeah, all the things are going on. Right, so we go straight from gratitude to this unsatisfied feeling of we always want yeah. more, right? And I love what Dave said. He said contentment can be learned and it's not inherent. And you see that sure. even on Black Friday coming up, but also like think of little kids. The first word they we always joke about that they learn is no, but then they also don't need to be taught more, right? Yeah, and they so know. It, that is in us, this unsatisfied yeah. feeling. And I just love what Dave preached about this. You morning. know, and it's interesting too, because anytime you get more, it never it's never enough. Like right. I always joke that it's just it's it's unending, it's an mm -hmm. un relenting desire to have more mm -hmm. and more and more. And the thing we've got to learn is how to be content uh, with what we have. And honestly, it's the boundary of contentment that actually makes us happy, right. not more. More never makes you happy. <laughs> no. It's contentment. It's learning to guard and have that boundary that makes all the difference. Uh, you know, one of the things we love is hearing from some of you uh, during that. We were looking back at the Reframe series. And so uh, I heard from Jude responding to one of the comments that uh, I put out there. And Jude said this. It said, uh, said, well said, knowing we are moving closer to the eternal life changes everything. When I can't afford something or I just think, oh, won't be needing this, all that junk because I know that Jesus will return. And if there's one thing that the Reframe series has reminded us, it's to look up and see the upper story that God's writing and not, Sarah, not to be focused on the small story, the mm -hmm. lower story that's the here and now. We want to be focused on what's happening above mm -hmm. with all that. Yes, and it's funny because as you were reading that from Jude, I thought back to Psalm 23, which a lot of us know. Yeah. Um, and it says, the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. And so he even knows that this is at the inner core of our being. And when we really fix our eyes on Jesus yep. and we're satisfied in him, there's something about us that that wanting goes away and our wanting turns from material things to him. Yeah. One more comment I want to read from some of you from our church <laughs> online platform. Another one said, this our faith is too small and expectations are too ridiculous god provides all the things we need for life and godliness we want things that do not pertain uh, to life and or godliness and that that's so true like uh, our desires like if we just trust ourselves with it our desires are too small like we don't get what god's really doing in the big picture and that that's just one of the things that's uh, so true you know one of the things we're looking forward to as an online family more than anything else is we've got groups that are beginning to launch uh in january and so to prepare the way we need group leaders we need people out there we think that there are some people out there that are going to be great group leaders they already know it they just need some encouragement so joining us all the way this weekend from paducah kentucky is sarah one of our favorite group leaders we love this group leader who is joining us steven we got lynn from paducah lynn how are you doing how long have you been a group leader what's your favorite part of leading an se online group lynn good morning good morning from cold paducah uh, yeah <laughs> uh i love leading my group. Uh, I started, I tried out a couple of groups and then one of the group leaders asked me would I consider becoming a group leader because she was moving on to a different uh, position at church and I said well I don't know and uh, I started <laughs> thinking about it and I said let me think about it, let me pray about it and I like um, all of the other leaders uh, in Jesus life did not feel worthy to do it. I thought, mm -hmm. I don't know enough. I started making excuses, mm -hmm. but that tug on my heart would not go away. And it yeah. was Jesus telling me, you need to do this. You need to stop. It's amazing, I love that, Lynn. Lynn, how we can think we're unqualified. <laughs> I, mean, I think that's so amazing. Yeah, I mean, me too. I, Lynn and I actually had a really great conversation on the phone yesterday, mm -hmm. kind of talking through um, her being on with us. And it was so sweet for us to just uh, not try to compare ourselves, but also say like yep. all of us are unworthy, right? Yep. Like there's nothing special about Stephen and I standing here, but we're so excited that we get to be used by the Lord in these groups and just in ministry. And I just love that, Lynn. So I want to ask you, what's the biggest thing that God has taught you through leading groups over the past couple of years? What's 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 the best thing that I've enjoyed about leading groups? Sorry, I'll say it again. What's the biggest thing that God has taught you oh. through leading groups? <laughs> yes, that. 
he uses us to reach others. Watching the mm. ladies in my group and me learn together from all over the country, never met each other, and how he works in our lives, changes our lives. Uh, my co-leader now joined our group uh, early on and she was baptized last year. I was mm. asked to do that and now she co-leads. And oh, that's, that's awesome. awesome. changes in, in their lives and how we learn together and are accountable to each other. Um, they're mm. listening and praying for me, even as I'm talking, that I'll say the right word mm. to honor God this morning. <laughs> so, <laughs> <laughs> Lynn, I love, love the it. story of transformation because that's yeah. really what it's all about. Uh, what encouragement would you give to someone maybe that right now that's listening in and identifies with you, kind of feels like maybe... Uh, they aren't the most qualified group leader, but also still feels that tug on mm -hmm. their heart that this is something they should be doing. What encouragement could you give to that person listening in right now to send an email to Southeast Online for a conversation? Maybe they should mm -hmm. be a co-leader or maybe they could begin leading or at least having a conversation with us. Uh, give them an encouragement. He won't stop tugging on your heart, number one. He's persistent. Jesus is persistent mm -hmm. and he knows what we're capable of doing. He knows the whole picture already. We all offend, yeah. we all do not, we'll never be perfect like he was, but he yep. is a model for us and he can show us the way as we attempt to walk through it. And so yep. if you can be a sheep and follow uh, him, you can do this job. And the only major qualification is, do you love him? Do you love yeah. Jesus? Mm. If you do, yeah. say yes. It's the best gift you'll give yourself and um, uh, the people you work with in your group. Love that, Lynn. That's Thank awesome. you so much. That is, yeah. uh, it's good to see you on here and, and just appreciate you taking the time to share that uh, with us, Lynn. So thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, and to you at home. Happy holidays. Uh, we really, yeah, yeah thank you. <laughs> And to those of you at home, that's something we really do want to let you know is that uh, it's possible to, to lead a group. And so just send us an email uh, to southeastonline at secc.org because uh, we'd love to follow up with you. And really, Sarah, what we're signing yeah. up for when you send the email is just a conversation. Absolutely. This is not saying, oh, I'm going to sign up to be a leader for the next three years of yeah. my life. No, this is just a conversation yep. for us to get to know you and to know your heart and just see, you know, if you would be um, a great fit for us as yep. a leader. Yeah, and like Lynn said, some of our leaders step into co-leading situations, mm -hmm. so there's, there's all sorts of ways uh, to do right. that. Especially if you're hesitant. I think, like, being a co-leader is a great way to kind of get your feet yep. wet, as we would say. And so don't let that scare you either. Like, again, this is just a conversation for us to get to know you and to just hear your heart about it. For sure. Y'all, thank you mm -hmm. so much. Uh, for being a part. We've got a brand new sermon series to the full that begins yes. next weekend. Yeah, and Christmas series. Super excited yeah, about it. Yeah, it begins next weekend with all of that. So we're excited to do that. We get to hear from Kyle in a couple we of do. weeks. Yes. Uh, so it was good. We got to see him last week. So it's kind of fun mm -hmm. as a staff. A few of us got to see him. So uh, good yeah. to see Kyle. So we'll be hearing from him soon. But thank you so much for being a part of Southeast mm -hmm. Online, y'all. We will see you back next weekend after Thanksgiving. Have a great Thanksgiving break, and we'll see you back after. Bye, guys. <laughs>